Nothing Charles just released one of the albums of the year. It's a great sound, highly original, innovative, groundbreaking, and a great 21st century dark pop record. I caught up with her to talk about the record, her views on life, and a great take on where we're going to be going post-virus. when it comes to yeah. music yeah well it's, it's it's a good way of working isn't it i mean so do you work uh with, is, the role is i guess you come in with a song and an idea and ben works as the engineer or, or does he present parts to one you just kind of merge them together or is it like is it a team or is it dictatorship yeah. oh it used to be more of a dictatorship whereas now he's kind of he's kind of trying to overthrow me from behind the scenes yeah. um honestly it, in the beginning it was a case of I would bring in these, and I still do this, I still use GarageBand, um, but really poor quality recorded um, demos where it's, it used to always be piano and vocal. And it would just be a one take thing, an idea at the piano. They were actually quite fully formed ideas on the first album. So that was really difficult for Ben to work with when they're such concrete ideas. Mm-hmm. Didn't really give him much room to manoeuvre or to... And too much to work with, really, because they, they were kind of all there. And it's become more and more collaborative on each album. Mm-hmm. So like this one, um, it's our fourth one we've made together. And it's a proper amalgamation of the two of us. Um, luckily, we have the exact same taste in music. Um, it's it's, a, like, it's spooky. Like um, Both of us, our favourite Talkin Heads album is Naked, mm-hmm. um, which is, you know, a bit of a weird one. But... And, um, even when it comes to like sonic references and I, I kept saying it, I was like, you know, I kind of want it to be like Dr. John, but also Sesame Street. And he gets that. He probably gets it. Um, so it's it's a real collaborative effort now. Like some on a few of the tracks, he's come to me with a starting point. Um, I just put my name on it and take all the credit. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting that because it's sparser. And that's what I like about as your music has gone on, it's got more percussive and more and emptier as well. Yeah, I mean, there's um, um, Ben is definitely responsible for all of the rhythmic elements, right? Most, yeah, he's an amazing drummer. And I think, I mean, there's so often some of our favorite music is like hip hop, like hip hop sounds amazing because there's not much going on um and i think you find that when there's we definitely found it playing live when you're trying to it's always really difficult to replicate the record and it's it's pretty pointless never try and replicate your record it's never going to sound the same it can sound better actually sometimes (laughs) but what i've noticed is like when we um when we scale things down live and we you know we had we have to just pick out the parts which are important in the song, or integral to the song. They can sound better a lot of the time because there's so much of the noise that wasn't necessary. And I think we've taken that approach when we've been making this album because also Ben and I aren't the most technically great musicians. And so there's Ben's guitar playing, there's me doing the odd little bit. It's mainly Ben playing instruments on this one. And he isn't um, a trained musician apart from in, at drums. And I think that there's something to be said in that. And I, I really don't like things like guitar lines that are full of too many trills. Mm. Um, so it's a lot more direct on this one. Yeah, I guess because he's a really good engineer, he can make simple things sound complex and put them in the right spaces. And I mean, I'm not, it's not just him, obviously, because you're the ears, aren't you? You're, I'm guessing you're sat in the chair going, no, yes, no. <laughs> this is a thing. We've been working together for nearly 12 years. And it's like he, I'm, I'm conscious that he might watch this, listen to it. Um, so I'm <laughs> careful what I say, and I don't want him to know my trick. But I, then we have like, um, it's like it's, we have never spoken about this before, but I know it works. He can just tell if I don't like something in the studio because I'm just not moving. I'm not doing anything. And as soon as I like something when we're messing around, if he plays anything, I'm like, yeah, that. Mm. And if I haven't said yes that, then I'm like, I don't want this. No, I don't want this. And you can just tell by the look on my face. I'm just, I literally will look away sometimes like, <laughs> uh-uh, I don't like it. Um, 
Yeah, and so I'm there the whole time. But it's really fun. I love when we pick apart a demo that I bring in. And I lo- it always starts like Ben, just, I feel like he's destroyed my song. Every time, every time I bring in a track, I think like, oh, nice one. He's balls it up again. She is. He, tra- he just takes it to shreds. And then I'm like, why is it? And then give it. It's so weird. He can hear what something is going to sound like 10 steps ahead. Whereas I can't always preempt that. He can. He already knows how something's going to sound later down the process. I haven't got that ability. So in the moment, I just think he's making a load of rubbish. Um, but it always seems to come back round. So I've learned to just kind of hide my disgusted face. It's like, what is this? And be patient because I know that he's going to get take this track somewhere interesting later on. But you're already 10 steps down another line because you worked out the melody, haven't you? So... Yeah, but it's um, it was really I really enjoy when I like the look on his face when I bring something to Ben, um, because like, he just we just don't know we don't really know what to expect what the other one's going to do, and I've never been in a proper band, but I imagine that we've got a really this is a, this is a really healthy working relationship that we've got <laughs> for being in a band. We never had a fight on tour, um, <laughs> but we also have massive respect for the other one. And I think we both know how vital each other's roles are. Hmm. Um, and I couldn't do what I do without Ben, and he couldn't do what he does without me. And it's, um, yeah, it's a really healthy working relationship in that sense. So, so lyrically, I mean, do you have them all worked out? Or sometimes you're just singing the melodies, as you know, or whistling the melodies or humming the melodies? Or, or, or do you have all the lyrics worked out when you go to Ben? No. Normally it's like... I'm quite a lazy writer. So if I'm like, what tends to happen a lot is I get dead pleased with myself over like a verse I've written or a chorus or, you know, something, a, a few lines that I've written. I get really pleased with myself. Like, um, and I just keep repeating them over and over again. And I'm too lazy to go back and finish the song. I get too excited. Um, so what happens is when we come to doing the albums, it always happens where it's like, Nadine, you've got a week to finish your lyrics. And I'm like, oh because um, the verses will all be the same verse. I think it's quite easy to spot on my songs where I've started them. And I, I find it with other musicians as well. I'm constantly trying to work out what was their first lyric. And I love when you hear a lyric in someone's music, and I'm like, oh, they're, I bet they're well happy with themselves about that one. Oh, I bet they're well chuffed about that lyric, smug buggers. Because we are. <laughs> I can hear it in like... I remember listening to a Guy Garvey song. I can't remember what it was, but there was some lyric that poked out and I was like, I you just know the face he'll be pulling when he when he wrote that. <laughs> yeah. you even enunciate it more. And the ones you're embarrassed about a bit, you kind of... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it always happens that there's about a week left to finish lyrics. And then it's... Um, and I love that pressure, like, stop being lazy, go and do it. And I take a bunch of trains. That's where I do all my writing. Um, on train journeys. That makes um, sense. The rhythm of a train does make your mind think of words, doesn't it? Yeah, and it's just like a state of limbo almost as well, where it's like you're uncontactable. Mm. Um, like, yeah. I mean, not one of those I mean, busy trains where you're just like, right, this is the worst experience of my life <laughs> and you're sat next to some awful, like, coffer or something. Um, I work out good routes that I know are going to be quiet. I know I'm going to have some space by myself. So it's never rush hour. That would be awful if it didn't rush hour train yeah. right now. Yeah, to start, you'd be singing into your phone surrounded by loads of people. Yeah. <laughs> something quite glamorous about train travel. Oh, I love well, this form of transport when it works. Yeah, yeah exactly. When it, when it works. Yeah. Um, or when I, I mean, it's pretty expensive as well, but yes, that's where, because I also, the studio is in Brighton and normally I'm living in London. And so there's just train journeys to the studio and um, to Brighton and back to London twice a day. Mm-hmm. Those journeys as well, it's a really great opportunity for me to listen to, to what we've made in the studio in another context and then think about it and then bring it back in the next day. Mm. So thematically, do you have it worked out? Because each album's got a kind of a theme, not like a concept album, but the, the songs are linked together. They're about things, aren't they? So the, the new album is a very um, a powerful women's perspective. And then, you know, done arms about alienation, immigration, etc. I mean, is this something you work out before 
you do the record, do the songs kind of suggest the theme as you go along? That's it. The song suggests the theme. And again, it was, there was one lyric that I had and I was really chuffed with myself. It, the first lyric that I had was, um, for the whole album was, shave my legs, freeze my eggs. Will you want me when I'm old? It was actually, will you F-U-C-K me? I don't know where this is going to go out, so I won't swear. Which would have been a great line. Yeah, will you F me when it I'm old? Not radio, but... <laughs> and I, and I'd, for, I'd forgotten that was what it was. And then I... But I'd kept... I remember, like, being on nights out. Tell me who I told. Um, Ezra Furman. I was on a night out, and Ezra Furman was there, and I was like, I've got this lyric. <laughs> and Ezra was like, that is amazing. You've got to do it. You've got, I want to be on that song. And was messaging me about it. Honestly, I told so many people that lyric about two years ago. Like, I've got a new album. And it's a shame. Like, I was just really, and, but then that dictated like the, the where the album was going to go. Because there's so much embedded in that, isn't there? There's misogyny, the policing of women's bodies and tradition. Um, so there's a lot, of, there's a lot, of, there's a lot in that, which kind of that guided the rest of the theme of the album. Hmm. I mean, do you think, um, it's getting, it's got worse women or better for women? Or do you think women are just more aware of what they should have? Uh, it's complicated, isn't it? Because sometimes I think it just looks like it's better for women and not much has changed. Like, um, the week, the, I think it was the week after I'd just finished recording the album. Yeah, it was about a week. I'd just finished recording the album. And within, and then within one week, I was attacked twice by men in the street. Like random attacks. Uh, one time, a guy I like, had choked, tried to choke me in the street, and then another time, a guy had just I was on his bike and just pushed me over and called me something, called me like a slag or something like that. These were just unmotivated acts, random unmotivated acts that happened to me twice in one week, and I, there is definitely a lot of change that needs to happen. I I don't understand why um, why this is still happening. But, um, so yeah, there is there is so so much change. I'm excited with it that needs to happen. I'm excited about certain things in the music industry that I'm seeing change in. I like that there is a conscious effort, you know, to to ensure that gender balance is is more fair, that it's more equal. Um, there's more representation of women. But it, it or, but then it's not just the fault of the festival bookers themselves. We need more people on radio, radio presenters playing women. We need record labels signing women. I think it's quite unfair to just place blame just on the festivals because they work with whatever the, you know, mm. whatever there is around. It's actually harder for them. In it is sense, it? them. But then yeah. you get radio DJs and you get record labels that are going, yeah, festivals, try harder. And it's like, you give us some more female. They just all, That's what happens in the music industry all the time. And I hate it. People just pass the book. What I do, well, it must have been him. Oh, it's not us. I'm like it is you. Take responsibility. Sort it out, and then it'll then it'll change. Mm. Um, and I'm starting to see some change in the music industry in that sense. But I think there needs to be a better, it be a better challenged, um, channeled approach. I, mean, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I think it's grassroots up. It's changing. You know, it's far more women in bands and it's not it's, people don't even mention it now which I think is a victory because when I was growing up if there was a, a woman bass player she would get mentioned all the time but now it's just the bass player and it? it's a small victory but it's <laughs> all the time but it's a genre you know oh female it's a genre yeah. and when, I, when I first started out people kept trying to um journalists kept trying to pit me against um Anna Calvi all the time they want me oh you know and it's like there's only room for one of you there's not enough room there's all I hate what well, know what that um that theory is called it's kind of a slice of the pie there's enough pie for everybody mm. no one's taking your share but people try to even and it was awful just trying to create competition between me and another female musician like there's only room for one of you only <laughs> we only have one miserable lass in this room I'm like <laughs> no you can have us both. She's only little. We'll both fit in fine. Um, and that, that kind of behaviour is really ugly. And that was, that even made me think, well, she's my enemy. She's my enemy. Is she my enemy? Do I need to, is this a competition? It's not a competition, mate. Um, and we're very good friends now. 
and I love her music and I celebrate her music and she's really kind about mine also. But um, that kind of behaviour was encouraged so much in the music industry, pitting women against each other. And I can see so much more solidarity now between women who are like, hang on, did he tell you that? Oh, because she told me that. And that, oh, okay, we actually all love each other. We want each other to do well. Brilliant. And that solidarity is going to do a lot for, for women in music. It's really important. So, so the the album itself now, like, it's, I, mean, this, this, I like this theme, this idea, and sort of topics you talk about. I mean, as as a woman who's getting older, which is a good thing. I mean, it's, it's, that's quite that's in the tracks. I can see, you know, the way you write about, like the line you said before, the insecurities and the expectations as well. I mean, these these are these are big subjects to tackle in three minute songs and great subjects. Yeah, my um. The the things I always wanted to talk about, I remember I remember when I was younger and I was on holiday, I was in Italy with my mum and my dad. And men would do this thing when I walked past, do it all the time to me. Um, they were cheering, like, hey, bella, bella, bella. And I'm like, oh, stop it. I actually didn't like it because it got too much. And my mum was going, my mum later on said, oh, I love walking behind you on holiday. I feel, like they, I feel like I'm getting it. It's all for me. <laughs> and, I was like, it's all, and I was like, what? And she'd said, because when you grow older, you become invisible. And that always stuck with me. My mum is beautiful as well. Like she's, I think she gets more beautiful the older she is. Um, like she's really, she's a very glamorous sort of woman as well. She's like, she looks like some kind of movie star, man. But to say that, is such it really upset me when she said that I'm like don't talk even like saying to my mum I'm like don't talk about my mum like that yeah <laughs> no she wonderful but that is that is something that she, it's a genuine thing that she felt she felt that she was becoming more and more invisible and I I think there were we don't especially in the music industry we don't see a lot of older women and we don't hear a lot from older women it's really, you know, and we need more visibility of older women. What I would like to do at some point is start an initiative to, to invite women back into the music industry. Women who left because they had children. Women who left because they thought there was no place for them because they were growing old. Um, women in tech who left because they had kids. Whatever reasons, try and encourage women back in because it must be so difficult if you've had a kid and you've taken time off or you just wanted some time out and you're 10 years older and you feel like youth is currency and you feel like you no longer possess it, it must be so difficult to re-enter into the music industry. So as much as by doing things to encourage young women to get into music, I think it's as important to get older women mm. back into music. I don't want my career to end soon because I'm, in my, I'm nearing the end of my 30s. I want to know that I can be making music and have this career until you've got to push me off stage, you know, wheel <laughs> me off. Yeah, um, like, like so, yeah. Tom yeah. Waits, you, wait. you know, people who when they get older, they're like a fine wine. They kind of hone their art down. Or, or um, to be fair, Patty Smith as well. She's my, well, she just get somebody had said to me. Oh no, it's um, you know, it's hard to be a mother and be a rock star. I'm like, have you heard of Patty Smith? <laughs> yeah. Um, but I mean. Women growing older in music is such a beautiful thing. Joni Mitchell, that album she does when she revisits some of her older songs, and there is the version she does of um, A Case of You. I never liked, I didn't like, I'm not a massive fan of young Joni. Old Joni, I'm in. <laughs> Old yeah. Joni, who's, you know, <sighs> I mean, you can hear, she so does this version of A Case of You as an older woman, and it is, it's, painfully beautiful you can hear that she's lived and she's lost and she's loved um and it's it holds such great weight that version um is one of and i find it very hard to listen to but it is one of the most beautiful pieces of music i've ever heard it's really stunning so we need more of that i was reading one of the interviews and you would talk about with this album it's saying not a new type of woman but a different kind of role for a woman in society you know the, the mixed expectations you know the mother because this that's another theme in it you know what you're, 30, you're 34 now and that pressure to have have the child or whatever and what why do you not feel like that and these are these are good themes strong themes and it may be um 
maybe a voice for a lot of women to feel like that as well. I don't know. It's uh, are the, are these things that, you, that go into the creation of this record. I mean, the, there's been a, actually a lot of the reviews have been written by women, and whenever um, when they're interviewing me, you know, sometimes they press stop on the on the tape, and they're like, "Oh my god, I can totally relate to this and this and that," and oh my, and then I thought this, and me and my friends always say this, and I'm like, "Yeah." Nice one, mate. Um, there was a man interviewing me this morning and he said, you know, I know it's an album about um, subjects that relate to women, but he's like, I can relate to so much of this. And, you know, and he was saying, you know, uh, on songs like there's one called Ukrainian Wine, where it's about, you know, growing up, you know, these expectations, like get a mortgage, do that. And he has those kind of pressures on him there as well. I mean, there's, there's different kind of pressures on men. There's many of us as well. But I love that. I love the fact that the men that I know are all feminists. Um, every man I'm surrounded by is a feminist, or my close friends, Ben Hillier, especially. He was the one the whole time encouraging me to be louder and bolder on the album. I, I was worried about saying, you know, uh, talking about bestiality in um, Ladies for Babies, Goats for Love. And Ben was like, that's brilliant. More of that. Carry on. This is class. Mm. Um, mm. That's been a really beautiful thing, having that support there as well. Hmm. I mean, do you think, you know, growing up where you grew up, that must be a massive... I love the way everything about you is so, in, in a sense, contradictory, but, you know, that's 21st century. But you grew up in a... It's quite a white part of the country. I am imagine it's... Well, it's Whitburn actually means white stream anyway, doesn't it? <laughs> which is quite funny. With a Norwich... Is it Norwegian mother or... Um, which which one's which in your parents? Your mother Norwegian. Yeah, mum uh, mum half Norwegian, but she's like tall blonde Scandi lady. Yeah, and then my Pakistani. So you've got that, and and then you you get a music background which is contradictory to that. So it's all those little differences are quite fascinating. The, the, these must have been really important creatively. You know, they must have really couched you when you when you're growing up. Yeah, I mean it's. Um... It's I also I find that you know being English and but also being mixed race is contradictions that are there, and there's been so many things that I've struggled with growing up when it comes to identity, because the kind of this idea of not being white enough to be white and not being brown enough to be brown, so not really being accepted by either, mm -hmm. um, was very very difficult, and so I think that forced me to be much more reclusive, um. And that forces creativity, I think, especially when you're exploring your own identity. I think that is something that then makes you makes you very creative. And I was, you know, I was forced to sit in a library by myself. Um, and, it was kind of, and it's, you know, and uh, I think that that has properly informed my work. And I do like to highlight these things as well. I mean, do you feel English, a different version of English? I mean, I mean, no matter what people say, this country is quite good at mixing things up and there's a lots of different versions of Englishness. When you go to other countries, there's only one version, isn't there? So, yeah, yeah there's downsides, but sometimes you could only come from here, couldn't you, which is pretty great, I think. Yeah, I mean, there's no such thing as an in, Indigenous English person. I mean, the, the, what was it, the first recorded settlers here were like Welsh, you know. <laughs> yeah. No such thing as Indigenous English. I always find that phrase really... <laughs> well, it's in boggling, isn't it? Um, I get, I do, I consider myself English, but I'm just a second generation, mm. second generation English kid. And do you find you, you're obviously your, your parents being from completely different places? Uh, that, that's very opposite cultures, which is fascinating. Do, do you explore those parts as well? Your Norwegian parts, your is, is your dad Pakistani Muslim or was he from originally? Hey, yeah, Pakistan. My dad was born in the year of partition as well. He's 72 now, mm -hmm. I, think, I think, maybe. Um, and I think I was always, I was always um, surrounded more by Pakistani culture growing up. They definitely, I mean, my mum is only half Norwegian and she was born here as well. But mm -hmm. she, it's a weird, it's a funny thing, isn't it? That she, she talks about it so much as if she was born there. <laughs> and it's like it's a, it was a thing that made her special at school. I think you know it's a, it's a thing that makes you stand out. 
Mm. Um, I didn't so much do that at school because it wasn't fashionable to be Pakistani and you'd get bullied. And I could pretend not to be Pakistani because I have this disguise of light skin. <laughs> and um, I would often pretend not to be. And then anything other, like, oh, I'm Persian. Um, <laughs> per- Spanish today. Mm, <laughs> trying again. And then, and then you know, Indian, anything but Pakistani. And especially after 9-11 happened, I was anything but Pakistani. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to leave the I wanted to leave the northeast because I found it. I was having a lot of trouble. I got really badly bullied in school and beaten up because um, apparently it was my fault, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and then I moved to London, and so, London is the exciting place for just yeah, multiculturalism. The multicultural city is great. Like I live in Manchester, and it's very multicultural. It's just not a deal. It, well, in the middle, you know, same as London. I mean, their their example. This is how the twenty first century could actually probably work. <laughs> you get to these places but when you go twenty miles away, you realise it's not so easy, is it? So, as you've got older, have you got more interested in, in your sort of Muslim Pakistani background at all? Have you explored it at all? Yeah, massively, and it's something that I want to explore in music one day. Oh God, it'll be awful, won't it? <laughs> just me and a shivar kameez on the front. <laughs> With like, just like, this is my Asian album. Oh, it'll be all ah, really terrible pronunciations, me doing Sufi songs or something. Oh, it'll be, it'll be awful, I promise. Beautiful music though, isn't it? Yeah. It's beautiful music yeah. and I love it. And, um, it's, you know, language is a gateway into accessing culture and stuff, but there are other ways as well. I don't believe that it isn't, I don't believe that it is the most important thing to, to gain access to another culture. There are so many other things via food, via Mm. music, via art. And those are the things that I explore mainly. I, um, you know, I cook a mean curry, many, many, many mean curries. And I learned so much about my heritage via food, loads. Um, I have a real desire to spend more time in Pakistan, to spend time in Pakistan. I haven't been there since I was very young my brothers have been often but I feel like it's been one of my brothers he expressed his kind of disapprove his disappointment that I haven't been there he's like why don't you go there I've been there loads mm. I'm like well it's different for him because he's a man imagine me going by myself I can't I cannot have the experiences that he has it's a very different country for how it treats mm. women mm. very different country um of course, you know, if I was with people and I don't want to, I just, I've always been very nervous, but I have so many relatives still in Pakistan, many women, and I want them to show me their Pakistan because it just sounds beautiful. Um, but I have been quite nervous of going and, you know, you know, my family seeing me as a 34 year old single woman who drinks and smokes isn't probably the best. <laughs> the best vision to be showing my family over there, but I, I really am like um, gagging to mm. go to Pakistan at some point. It's such a beautiful looking country; it's stunning. I mean, in a sense, you're just you're like a modern version or a version of several thousand different versions of somebody who's got Pakistani roots, aren't you? The same as you're another version of Englishness, aren't you? And I guess that's exactly. kind of what a lot of your music's about as well, isn't it? I, exactly that. Exactly that. And that's why um that I think it's really just visibility is such an important thing, isn't it? Mm. Where it's like, you know, we need well, flea bag was so great. Flea bag was brilliant. In fact, that was my favorite review. Somebody said, um, an Adine Shaw on Kitchen Sink is like Phoebe Waller Bridge in flea bag. And I'm like, Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> keep quoting it so then one day she'll see her name come and then we could be friends <laughs> um but i think it is it was you know her character in fleabag it's important that we see the destructive nature and you know her to- her story in comparison to her sister who's you know married and doing this and got this great job and it's really important that we see other versions of women because we you know we we see ourselves and then it's really mm. important that artists show us versions of ourselves. Um, it'd be a really sad place if you can't look somewhere and see someone who is like you. And then think, I've, I've been really touched when there have been young Muslim girls or young Pakistani girls in the UK that come to my gigs. Um, there was one show I did, and uh, during a song called Out the Way, I kind of ran about into the audience. And there were these two young girls, it was at the Roundhouse, 
um, not when we played together, another time. Was it when we played together? That wasn't that. That feels like years ago, but it was only December. <laughs> no way. It wasn't then. It was years and years and years ago. And um, it wasn't, it was a few years ago. Uh, they used to, I ran out into the crowd and there was two young girls sat there, both wearing like hijabs. Mm. And one just went, like that at me, said, thank you, mimed it. And then one went like that to me. <laughs> uh, I was crying. I was like, you know, they're really young. Like, you know, did you get your parents permission to come? You know, what's your, what's your backstory? You know, is this your first concert? Do you go to gigs a lot? I just wanted to know everything about them. And I was just so chuffed that they'd come. I was really chuffed when they, they mouthed, thank you. Always, that, that always, that's probably the highlight of my career. That sticks out forever, that kind of stuff. Really I mean, for cool. you, is music that kind of powerful force when you were younger that showed there was a, a way of making sense of your identity or a space to, to explore things? Uh, it was a safe space for me because mm -hmm. I was very badly bullied when I was young and it, it was a safe space for me. And also it's a thing that I got you know, a lot of pride from it. I felt very special because I had a very good singing voice from a really young age. From a really, and I've got a really good singing voice and I don't always use it. It's almost like a party trick, my singing voice. I don't always use it on my records or in my own music. And it's actually, it upsets my parents. And why don't, and when I sing in the house and I do musicals or Mariah Carey or something, so why don't you do that on your own music? Why do you cover it with all the loud noise? Why do you sing like a man? And all this kind of stuff. Um, but I've always had a massive voice from a very young age and it kind of, it defines you almost, doesn't it? People would, I was called like the singer. Oh, that's, oh, that's the singer. And kind mm. of famous for it in like, you know, in our town. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's a comfort really. Music has always been a constant for me. It's been the one constant in my life always. And I do find it a place there, a place of solace in making music. And yeah. What, what was the music? when you were a teenager that gave you that space? I mean, was it, was it just normal pop music or did you very early on find there was other stuff there? No, I didn't have any cool music. I, I've, I've definitely lied in some interviews and been like, yeah, I loved Scott Walker when I was seven. Did I hell? Um, Mariah Carey was my favourite, favourite artist. Mm -hmm. and, and it's because I could copy her and I could sing like her, you mm -hmm. know? So big vocalists, so Mariah Carey and Whitney Houston. Those two I would copy loads. Um, and then it was later on gospel music because I'd heard Eva Cassidy on the radio mm -hmm. uh, and Terry Wogan had played her. He championed her and I loved Eva Cassidy. And again, I could sing like Eva Cassidy, like these massive notes and stuff in a big range. Um, and she had done some covers of gospel songs. I started singing gospel and then. Uh, yeah, and it just, everything kind of led to another thing. I started listening to older gospel music and then someone said, have you heard, and then someone said, oh, you can sing quite low. Have you heard Nina Simone? Nina Simone was the first, my first kind of proper obsession in music, like a proper one. And she's probably been the most inspiring force in music for me ever. It's taught me I could use my lower register mm. as well. And then I learned a lot about her story. And I've always been massively inspired by her story. Um, yeah, she had a bloody tough time, and it's disgusting mm -hmm. what happened to Nina. Really sad. You can you can hear it in her voice, feel it in her voice, can't you? Uh, yeah, it, it, it's so painful. Have you seen the film? It's the documentary, and I think her, and there's so much of her daughter in it. What's it called? What's happened to Miss Simone? Or what happened to Miss Simone or something? Mm -hmm. It's just it's heartbreaking. It's really heartbreaking. She was like gaslighted by that guy and all this stuff. And oh, mm. she's just, I mean, there's no, she invented a genre. Do you know what I mean? She's just <laughs> like, I mean, she put classical music to jazz and she invented a bloody genre. And I still don't think she gets the accolades that she kind of deserved. And and only after her death, she gets this kind of a, um, the, the, the music school that which didn't accept her when she was younger as a classical pianist, then kind of gave her some, bullshit uh, honorary degree or something I'm like no no it's too late keep it <laughs> I know the way yeah so so how come you like you talk about before how come you didn't go for the um 
the full on pop career, but what took you on this really interesting idiosyncratic journey? Tried. <laughs> oh, <laughs> did, did it not feel comfortable? Did you not feel comfortable? You think there was this is not you, there is something, there's another way of making this music. Yeah, I, well, I was a jazz singer for a long time, and it was there that they kind of any, any kind of, um, dream of being a pop star went long ago. I went to art school. Mm-hmm. Now that'll, that'll kick the pop out of you. <laughs> Bloody hell. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I went to art school and that changed my mind. And then I started looking at music in a completely different light. Um, even like my, the way I listened to things completely changed, uh, as I was really, when I was looking for a, for, for a producer, for example, I was adamant. I, I went through loads of producers, met so many people and tried the same song with loads. Anybody who put my vocal too far forward and tried to put strings on it, I'd be like, nah, nah. I wanted it quite far back and I didn't want strings. That was my rule, like no strings on this album. Um, I think it was mainly my tastes were really informed at that time at art school. And it did just open me up to many, many more options. And it's where I learned to play piano. A, a teacher at art college had said to me, like, I know you can sing, but can you write? I said, no. She said, have you tried? And I said, no. She went, right, well, this is your project for next week, which I was really pissed off about because it was a, there was a better project I wanted to do. <laughs> and um, she said, just write me a song. And I was like, I can't just write you a song. She went, yeah, take the most in- intimidating instrument that you can, that you can think of, and try and write me a song. And um, my neighbour had a piano and then I just, I just got hooked to it because it's so easy to get a sound out of it. And I think once you're at art school, you realise that you see beauty in so many small minor details, don't you? And mm. I started looking at the world very differently from art school. Um, very lucky to be able, the, the kind of, the, the opportunities I was afforded as a kid growing up, I was very lucky, but my family were quite wealthy. Mm. Um, if I was from a poorer background, I don't think I would have had. Uh, half the opportunities that I had in front of me. So what does art school teach you about music then? You say um, the micro details or or do you treat music like a painting or or, or just look at it inside out Is it, or you look at it from a different angle? Yeah, I think so. It just meant I just, it just, like, like with art, just new ways of seeing all the time. And also I was just, and it's the crossover, isn't it? And it's like, kind of like a synesthesia of sorts there's like there's an you know sometimes I can see an image and it just inspires so much in my head and I'm like right I can hear what this is I can like I know it sounds all hippy dippy and like yeah whatever sure but I can I can kind of see an image and it automatically I can hear something in my head that I want to put to that image I think that's the kind of stuff I was taught at art school. It just kind of forced you. You would just ask questions all the time and you were constantly questioning stuff. And we were young. We were like, I was 18 and I was in London. And I was just, you know, I was going to gigs at art school as well. You'd go, because those of us, like the, the, the fit lads and the cool girls in the year above, like us, were all in bands and they were putting on gigs in Camberwell. And we'd go to those. Mm-hmm. Um I was in London and it was a really exciting time. I was going to loads of gigs and loads of ones that people from art school would tell you to go to. So you were listening to loads more things and you're singing loads more things. And it's just, it was just such an exciting time. I really, I really loved it. But then I dropped out. Mm. Well, that's, that's classic art school. <laughs> classic <laughs> art school. Classic uh, musician, isn't it? Dropped out. <laughs> in a way, you could be one of the last art school musicians you know that great tradition that started in the 50s ran through punk post-punk all the way through the 60s and everything that was but now everyone goes to music schools don't they but yeah and it's and it's expensive man Mm. um it's really expensive and i i really worry about the future of music (laughs) it's hard to be a music it's getting harder and harder i think Mm, especially Um, now yeah I mean, now it's virtually I'm trapped in this box. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, yeah, it, I mean, it's it's a scary time for me financially because it's my bread and butter. So I can't imagine what it is for, for some other bands. You know mm. what I mean? It's like, oh man, this is a really terrifying time. 
Mm. That's why I'm back at my parents' house. I couldn't afford my rent. So it um, it's a really it is a really scary time for musicians. There's nothing. There's nothing more depressing when you're a musician to hear from somebody who's got records and you've had albums in the top fifty, top seventy five, and they're broke as well. <laughs> the mountain is like unclimbable, isn't it? You realise there's yeah. only like 100 people who, who can survive this thing. <laughs> when you hear that, you're like, what? What? And sh- what? Their skin? Oh, I've got no chance. That's it. Unless, <laughs> unless I get that John Lewis advert this year. I tried for it last year. Mm-hmm. John Lewis advert. <laughs> get close. <laughs> they said it was too, it was too, it was too miserable. It was too macabre. And I was like, what? You're all, your adverts. That's what they're about. They're meant to be really dreary, rubbish versions of a popular song. Come on, I can do that. I mean, I never thought I'd ever put myself forward for an advert and things like that. But I think there was that story from I mean, my favourite band, The Fat White Family. They're my favourite. Mm-hmm. And I think it's like Lias or someone tells a story of, oh, was it Easy Jet or somebody? I think it was Easy Jet had offered them like £150,000 for one of their songs and they'd said no. He's like, that is one of my biggest regrets, mm. saying no to that. Because if they're going to use it, I mean, Blur, they had one of their songs on that British Gas advert. And apparently, Damon Albin, all the profits from that go to an environmental charity, apparently. Well, he can afford that, which is great. He's done it, but he's, exactly. yeah. he's done the money. I know, I think the concept of selling out is so stupid. You know, I think, um, of course, it'd be great if everyone just bought a million of your records and you could turn it all down. But most people are broke. You know, it's it's an indictment of the culture that a musician has to sell uh, uh, music to adverts, not of the musician. <laughs> you know, people really? should get paid for their arts so they can survive. I know, and then, you know, you get people go, oh, you're selling out. Da, da, da. Well, you know what? D- give me another option. Buy my mm. T-shirt. I mean, it, I'm still baffled about how how poorly artists are treated when it comes to streaming revenues. I just mm. think it. Because right now, imagine that could be doing us a massive favour right now. You know, that could really be a nice support, a mm. little bit of little cushion there for us. Because we've got no shows. Mm. But no, that's still unfair. So hopefully going forward that we will bring about change where that that has to change. It's why so don't, why don't un- Spot, Spotify, all they have to do is say, why don't as a punter who has Spotify, why don't you pay twenty pounds a month voluntary? And the extra ten pounds we'll give to the bands on top of what they're getting now, and you don't have to pay it. You can still pay the ten quid if you want, but if you want to keep these musicians going, pay the twenty. It would not cost them a penny, and it made them look like a charity. <laughs> it's more of a it's more of a shareholder issue, though, isn't it? It's the way and the that publishers things- and the record labels they're all taking a cut. Exactly, the record labels aren't stupid. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, not when it comes to money. <laughs> not when it comes to money, they're not. No. When it comes to some of their ideas. Oh, no. <laughs> um, it's a great idea, Nadine, for the album. Have you? <laughs> do you want to say it in, in, in your head to yourself first before you say it out loud? <laughs> not say it. Um, but, yeah, it's just, you know, record labels ha- have huge shares. And then one of the dangers is that the weird music never gets anything. The exciting music never gets anything. It never gets a look in, in these shares, the way it's all divvied up. So that means classical music, jazz music, alternative music, you know, the exciting music. That's the ones that suffer the most from these streaming services. And it's, it's really, it's really unjust. It's not fair. No, it, <laughs> so, definitely the bottom of the pyramid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't like it down here. Come on. Sorry. <laughs> Honestly, I'm, I'm hoping that a lot of things are going to change going forward. I mean, well, are, just, are you optimistic about the uh, post-virus world? I mean, I try to be, but I just I keep seeing looking at um, Donald Trump or Putin or all those kind of maniacs eyes, and I, I think, oh God, it's just going to get accelerate to get worse, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I know it's all going to explode. It's just that I've had to take a lot of time away from social media as well. I've been, I, I, I've been, I've been watching the news a lot less. Especially just like, especially social media, where I don't think actually is a very good representation of the world at all. 
and it's only one version I'm being shown. It's like, what is what is Nadine Shaw like? Oh, she likes The Guardian. She likes sixth music. Oh, she likes Jay Rayner. And I get shown one opinion all the time, one tiny opinion, zoom, and it shows me what I will like, and it shows me what I what it what it knows I'll love, what it knows I'll hate, and it really knows how to wind me up. You know, it's like an abusive partner. It really knows what buttons to press. Um, the way the algorithms are formed. And so I've just spent a lot less time on social media. I'm a lot more hopeful that things aren't as bad as they seem, but there is so much and there are bigger forces than we know. We have no idea what's going on. And I just get, mm-hmm. I get really bogged down. And I feel what very... Think, uh, uh, oh. An artist's role in this is, I mean, a, a socially conscious artist like you are, you know, one, one that's actually aware what's going on off stage as well as on stage do you feel like you have a role you don't have to have a role you can just make your art i did yeah i do i mean like i was drunk tweeting last night um crispin hunt i'm joking i wasn't actually drunk crispin hunt is stepping down from his role at ppl and i really i would love to i want to be working there I want to be, because we, we need musicians to properly verbalise and to inform change, I think, because we know what's going wrong. We know where things mess up. We know how, we have we have solutions. We've got proper, realistic solutions. And I'm an okay public speaker, and I'm really passionate about protecting and making my this the music industry better for me mm-hmm. and for my mates and for other musicians that I don't know. I want to make it a better place because it's, it's unfair at the moment and it's the landscape has to get shaken up. It really does. And I, I do feel like not a duty, but it's just a passion of mine um, to speak out about things like that. And I think I'm, I'm able to do it quite well. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm all right doing that. Was it frustrating this album coming out during the virus period? I mean, on one level it means, People got more time to listen to it, but on the other the other problem is, I mean, you had that Glastonbury slot, you had things going on, and you couldn't do those either, could you? Oh, my Glastonbury slot was well good. I was next to Duncan <laughs> Anthony. Got it. Um, oh, it was a really. I doubt they'll give me that same slot. I'm. I want to hold them to it. Like you better give me. I better be on the same slot <laughs> next year. But maybe up the bill. And sometimes there might be a backlog of stuff to get on. They're gonna to have to have a six-day festival, that's it. Mm-hmm. Um what's it been like putting the album out during this time? It's just been apparently, actually, people have been listening to more radio and more music, but apparently what's been happening is that they've been listening to familiar music. So music, you know, for nostalgic reasons and not as much new music. Yeah. It doesn't seem to have the traction that we thought it would because more people are listening to the radio and what have you. Um, maybe with radio, that's been helpful. Mm-hmm. But I, I don't think it's picked up much more for us, to be honest. And like I thought it would at the beginning of this, mm-hmm. I'd said to my label, let's put it out sooner, let's put it out earlier. Mm-hmm. Everyone's indoors, get them. <laughs> and it said no, because I don't have the power that Laura Marling has because mm-hmm. Laura Marling brought her release forward. Uh, mine was put back. Not only was that idea poo-pooed on straight away, it was actually put back. I don't mind that. Um, I just feel like we've been advertising this album for bloody ages. It's um, It took a really long time. There's so many bits that I'm missing, though, that I normally do when an album comes out. Like on album release day, I always have a bit of a party. Mm-hmm. That My parents didn't even... They forgot my album was out. They don't give a shit. <laughs> 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 And touring, um, which is the uh, key now, isn't it? Yeah. But that, yeah. I mean, for finances, Torbin, but also for fun and for my head. I mm-hmm. love Torbin. I think actually lockdown has been good for me, though, to keep me away from like vices and things like that. Um, it's been good because touring can be, the, the amount of partying and touring can be too much. And I think I needed a break from that. Mm-hmm. So actually, the kind of, Forced staying in time has been pretty good for me for that, and I've been I've been saving money as well. Oh, that's I'm not going. Out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because there's nowhere to go. Is there nothing to yeah. spend it nowhere on? To go. I'm not earning any money, but I'm not spending any. Yeah, my parents. They've got they've got a fridge bigger than me.